Good morning. Good morning. I've never been described as artful before. Uh, I'm here to speak on invention, creation, and curiosity. Uh, it kind of embodies what I do for a living, and I'd like to explore it with you today by first discussing children, since they are probably the most creative things we, we see in our lifetime. We were all child once. You remember being creative. Uh, you created language. You weren't born with it. You learned it over time. You created words. Some twins are known to actually create languages that their parents don't understand. They're also very curious. They tend to try things. Uh, my son is a great example of that. When he was little, he got curious about the change in our car ashtray and decided to stick it in a slot on the dashboard. And he filled the dashboard with pennies, nickels, and quarters. We had an interesting sensation in that car for years with every sharp turn, hearing all that money shift from one side to another. So children kind of epitomize this process of, of creativity. What I've done in my lifetime is, is learn how to be creative and inventive. And I think it comes from several things. One is education. When you cross train in multiple fields, you start to be able to speak the language of those fields. And it helps you figure things out a little faster than someone in just one of those fields might be able to. The other is experience. And that simply comes with time and exposure to different problems. Um, I'll, I'll show you some of the examples of things we've done uh, in, in a moment here with some videos and describe the process in which they were. They were ideated, solved, and then finally developed. And many of them are still in development. They continue to evolve as new problems rise or as we find problems with what we first designed. Um, I will tell you that my lab and what we do has been described as a cross between Doc Brown from Back to the Future, and MacGyver. <laughs> and if, if they're equating that to invention, I'm flattered. If they're describing me as having those hairstyles, I'm not. <laughs> <clears throat> but in any case, it, it all centers on out-of-the-box thinking, which may be a cliche way of describing invention. But out-of-the-box thinking is truly what we do. I, I listened to someone speak recently, and they were describing not necessarily out-of-the-box as being a good thing. They said, if you're in the box, you're at least constrained on the sides and bottoms such that you can only go in one direction to try to find your way. And in fact, in education, when we're training people to become inventors, engineers, therapists, and clinical decision-making skills, we tend to do that. We give them a constrained direction to go so that they hone their skills on creation. But I think that out-of-the-box thinking really resembles being able to step out of the box, expand your boundaries in multiple directions, and allow those boundaries to intersect with other people who are also out of the box. That's kind of key to invention, is the collaboration. So in addition to cross-training yourself and understanding the language of multiple fields, it's also about collaborating with people who are also in those worlds to provide more, more ideas. So with that, let me start with my first video and describe the first problem we faced. I actually have an example of it here, and I'll get to that in a moment. This centers on children with disabilities. Uh, many children have disabilities. They have motor delays such that they don't crawl and move like normal children do. The movement patterns they exhibit can actually be measured at a very early age. The motor coordination they have, there are very specialized tools that will demonstrate they do have some movement. And what they found in children like this is that that movement, if not, she's fascinating, isn't she? That movement, if not promoted, tends to diminish. It disappears. Um, this was brought to my attention by a colleague at the University of Oklahoma and spurred the question, can we do something to help these children practice and get some positive reinforcement so they continue to practice? After lots of experimentation and trying and retrying, we came up with a device that, we, that fit the bill. It's called the SIPSI. It stands for Self-Initiated Prone Progressive Crawler, and this is an example of it. It's basically a wheeled platform. It's motorized. You can see a child on it here, and it's designed to react to their movements. So when the infant's on it, any movement they make can be transduced and provided as positive feedback through movement to engage them in the process. We've built multiple versions of this. They're driven by not just the movement of the child, but by their balance cues as they shift their weight. 
by gesture, getting them to lift their heads and make it go, and by subtle movements of their arms and legs. I often describe that like a turtle on a fence post, moving but not going anywhere. But the movements are still positive, so we go ahead and turn the device on. This was one of the first examples and early examples of taking the two fields of engineering and clinical medicine, combining them to solve a problem. The next centers on a young man who has a problem. This is Aaron. Aaron is seven years old in this video, and he has a disease called arthrogryposis. This disease doesn't allow his joints to bend very far. His elbows, wrists, hips, and knees just, just don't bend like yours and mine. He's very active. He enjoys being out and playing, but he can't do the things his brothers can do. He was brought to my attention through one of my graduate students, and his interest was to ride a bike. He wanted to ride a bike with his brothers. Yet this is the way he gets off the floor. He just doesn't have the mobility to do those things. So we knew in designing something for him, we'd be constrained. We had to look at his deficits and what we could do to try to work around them. Our efforts were to deal with his limited balance capability, his limited range of motion, he couldn't pedal like normal kids could, and his limited dexterity, he couldn't handle the handbrakes or twisting shifters that any bicycle would have. So given that, I put a team of engineering students and PT students together and kind of defined it as a service learning project and let them East cross train in the other's world to try to gain skills and as well as design something this child could use. The end result was this. We used a recumbent bike, a tricycle, for its stability and its easy on and off. We modified it significantly. Its hand controls allowed very limited shoulder motion for steering to be useful. We modified the pedals so that he could make a smaller circle and still propel the bike. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. We modified the braking system and simply took a handbrake, but not off a bicycle, off something we use in therapy that actually has a lock, and turned it around and placed it near his foot so he could press it to stop. It also allowed him a parking brake so he could get on and off without the, the system moving. He was so competent in this, you're looking at first day video. He got on and just started riding. He knew how it worked. He actually explained to his mother all the features it had, which surprised us. <laughs> um, and and it, just, it just, it was very successful. We, we have made a few modifications to it, you know, to keep it, keep it going, but in and of itself, it was a nice system. The final example I have relates to patients at the other end of the spectrum, um, geriatrics, patients who have suffered stroke, perhaps. In therapy, when someone comes in therapy suffering a stroke, and a stroke, by the way, is basically damage to your brain uh, that often results in loss. It can be loss of speech. It can be loss of part of your body. Uh, you lose the ability to control it. Patients, when they come to physical therapy, have to relearn how to use that part. The brain is very plastic to a degree. It's better at younger ages than it is when we're older, but it does remodel. It does try to make up for lost function. So in therapy, we rely on a lot of overuse, overdrive. You do more and more, lots of repetition to try to build the patterns back in areas of the brain that are still functioning. That's a very labor and time intensive process. Uh, walking is specifically important because you need to be able to get around. So what we did, based on problems we saw in the clinic, and again, engineering solutions, was modified an elliptical trainer so that the pedals articulated and did motions that the foot would do as it naturally hit the floor. This is an example of that. We call it the elliptically-based robotic gait trainer. And you'll notice that the feet are moving in a way that's normal to walking. This gentleman actually has a right side hemiparesis, his right side is weak, and if he wasn't walking on the device, he tended to drag his toe a little bit. He couldn't pick up his foot. Studies we've done on this have shown that patients gain gait symmetry and speed. They walk more normally. They walk faster. In fact, many of them were able to cross the street within a normal walk cycle after a very short time practicing on this device. So let me kind of close these examples and describe, again, what we do in my lab. We, we cross-train. I think it's interesting that out-of-the-box thinking is what's made Disney as famous as they are. 
they do a lot of interesting things with games and, and virtual reality. They actually employ virtual reality in many of the rides you see there. And I want to have you think about this a little bit. Virtual reality is a system where you're really not doing what the system is making you feel like you're doing. If you've ever been on any of these rides at Disney or Universal or any of these studios, they give you a sensation of motion that's far beyond what's really happening. And they do it by altering the visual sensations you're getting, the cues you get, and the motion. They, they make them slightly out of phase. They're not synchronous. It, it, if they go far enough, they actually make you seasick like you would if you were sitting in the back of a car feeling the motion but the front seat is not moving so the cues don't match, or out in the ocean where everything's rolling but there's no visual cue to synchronize with. Same process. They intentionally make you just almost seasick to make you feel like you got your money's worth. <laughs> I'm serious about that. There actually is, they, they market everything. They market study everything. Um, but let me describe again the other side of this. Imagine a patient with motion problems that their body is naturally having a mismatch between these cues. They feel like they're moving when they're not. That can be quite disabling. So what if we could actually create a system using Disney-like technology to make them feel normal while they're in that environment? Couldn't they use that to rehabilitate, to learn new patterns and develop normalcy that hopefully will carry over once they leave the device? So my lab cross trains. It is a place where we educate and ideate and invent every single day. As our list of projects, completed projects, continues to grow, the new projects that we have in the queue seem to be getting even larger. Um, it's been lots of fun. People who come in suggest that I play. They don't think I work much. I come in and play. And I do. I, I split my time, but a large chunk of it's involved in playing, just like children do in an effort to create, ideate, and invent. That, to me, is the essence of invention. Thank you very much.